So I'm Stephanie Taylor. Today I'm going to talk to you really about the power of mentorship. I'm really gonna talk about three specific programs, Google Summer Code, Outreachy, and the Linux Foundation Mentorship Program. I am the Google Summer Code lead. I've been leading the program since 2015 and on the Google Open Source Programs team since 2011. So, I will be spending a little more time talking about Summer of Code since that is my specialty, but we definitely have some really cool programs to talk about today as well. So, one of the things people ask when they're getting started in open source is they say it's really intimidating, which it can be, because where do you start? What community do you pick? How do you know if they're gonna, the people are gonna care about your opinions? Are you asking too many questions? So one of the things with mentorship programs really is about lowering that barrier to entry. It is key to make that barrier to entry as low as possible to get new people into your communities, especially people from all around the world. So another key aspect of mentorship programs is the skills. So whether you are a student or you're a post-grad or you're someone changing careers, whatever kind of state of your career you're in, mentorship programs are super helpful because you're going to improve your skills. You have experienced mentors that are there to teach you. They're guiding you. Now, they're not gonna teach you Python from you know, zero to 60. You need to have some familiarity with Python if you're gonna be working on a Python project. But the mentors are really gonna be there to help guide you, to help answer your questions, to show you open source kind of from beginning to end, the process, how to be involved in a community, and really kind of helping you see the different ways that you can find answers to questions. Sometimes it's as simple as that. It's like different resources. It's like you can use your favorite search engine, whatever that might be. And, but there are many other crafty ways to find answers to your question when you are working on an open source project. And really these mentorship programs are about making it easy for you to enter the community. Another thing to keep in mind is that open source is not just about coding. Some of the programs I'm talking about today are basically coding projects, but then there are others that really allow you to take part in the open source community in many different ways. Whether you are a technical writer or you, so, okay, let me back up. On technical writing, if you are coming to an open source project, you're looking for beginner documentation. Unfortunately, some open source projects have no beginner documentation. That is a problem. It is definitely well known that having beginner documentation is key to having a successful open source project because people need to know how to get started in your community, even if it's relatively basic. And so many open source organizations don't even have any documentation. So this is where the technical writers come in handy. We discovered this particularly with those who took part in our Google Code In program, which was a contest for high school students that we used to run. Because again, you're having high school students who are very new to open source. This might be their first introduction to it at all. So they had tons of questions. So the open source organizations that took part in the program that were mentoring realized very quickly they had to make much better documentation or they were just gonna be spending days answering questions nonstop. So the, the organizations that took part in GCI, they have much better documentation now. They're really good. They actually all have very good documentation, especially after two or three years of doing the GCI program. You also need marketers. You need people who can help spread the word about your community. And whether that's to just let people know what it is that you're doing so people will use the code, but also so that you can get more contributors to your community. Testers. Developers don't always like to test. Weird, I know. So you need to have people who enjoy testing and who are good at it. Because if you don't, you're gonna have some big problems later down the road. We also have the concept of design. A lot of times, the open source projects have probably some of the ugliest websites you've ever seen because they don't have designers. They have developers and they have great code, it's a great project, but no one has spent time on their homepage to make it pretty, or even to make it easy to find where that beginner documentation, 
that they have, but it's not easy to find because they haven't had anybody with kind of the UX skills or maybe just the time to go in and look at it from that perspective. You also need program and project managers. So often, especially as your community gets bigger, you may want to organize events. So you need event planners. But for the program and project managers, they're really helpful for when you have a big release coming up and organizing everybody to make sure everyone's on the same page, to organize responsibilities, to organize the calendar. So having all these different skill sets are essential to open source communities. The larger your community is, the more of these you're gonna have. And there's also even other skill sets that are needed as well. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the coding aspect here for the mentorship programs, just because that's what probably most people in the room are a little more interested in. But one of the things I always tell people when they're getting started, for example, in Google Summer of Code is think about what interests you. If you're gonna be joining any mentorship program, you wanna be joining a project that is interesting because you're gonna be spending three to six months working on this project. If it's something that's boring, that you don't care about, it's gonna be a miserable three to six months for you. So make sure you're looking at something that's interesting. So if you wanna learn more about security, look for security projects. If you wanna learn more about science, astronomy, data, social, AI, all of these different projects are available in the open source world. So just do your research. It does take time. You do have to go through and do some research to find the right project. Also think about what technologies that you're interested in. So for example, if you're doing Google Summer of Code and you need to be able to code in Python and you just started coding in Python two weeks ago, this is not the time. <laughs> this is, you need to give it another year, wait another year. But if you've been coding in Python for maybe eight to nine months, then you might be, you might be in a pretty good spot and you could take part in Summer of Code. You'd probably wanna be looking at the easy level projects, definitely not the difficult level projects, but the easy level projects, that's fine. But again, you need to have some familiarity with the programming language that you're gonna be coding with. With all of these mentorship programs I'm gonna talk about today, you can't just say, oh, I've been doing this for two weeks and I wanna learn in this, my mentor is gonna teach me everything about Python. That's not gonna work. You need to have some skills you're not expected to be an expert by any means, but you need to have some familiarity with whatever programming language that project is going to be in before you even apply. So these are some just quick basics on taking that first step into an open source community. Read through the chat logs, particularly for, I put a few days, but really a few weeks is probably more accurate because one of the things you wanna remember is not every community may be a good fit for you. So you wanna look at the way that the community communicates, community communicates with one another. And you also want to kind of get a vibe, understand the vibe of the community. Maybe it's not the right one for you. That's fine. Keep looking. There are many out there. You will find something that works for you. And you can tell a lot of this by just looking at their logs, looking at the, some of the mailing list archives. You can also kind of see more about the priorities of the organization and what they're doing by looking through their lists and what they care about right now. And please read the beginner documentation if there is any. Hopefully there's something. Uh, it might not be great, but at least there should be something. At the very least, most, mm -hmm, many, many orgs put on that uh, kind of beginner label so you can find, or first issue, I think, sorry, first issue is what most of them call it. So you can find those and you can at least see, okay, I can, I can do this, I, can, I understand what's going on here. If you don't understand how to do the first issue, that might be a little challenging, but again, communicate with the open source organization. I put on here, look at the licenses. There's a ton of different open source licenses out there. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but make sure that the organization you're looking at and the, is using a license that is something that reflects your beliefs because they're all you know, somewhat different and some are drastically different. So you do wanna make sure that they're releasing the code under a license that is what your belief system is as well. And again, 
making sure that the language is something that you know something about. All right, so I am gonna talk about Summer Code Outreachy and the Linux Foundation Mentorship Program. There are many other different open source programs out there. There are some that are led by governments, some that are led by universities, by research groups, by other companies. These are just three of the larger ones and that have been going on you know, for more years than many of them. So I'm gonna highlight these three today. So we'll start with Summer Code, my specialty. So we have been doing Summer Code for 20 years. That is a massive milestone. And we've had over 21,000 GSOC contributors over the last 20 years from 123 countries that have been accepted into the program. Over 19,000 mentors from 138 countries have mentored those GSOC contributors. And we've had over 1,000 open source mentoring organizations. Many of the organizations have taken part in GSOC for 10, 15 years. There's a couple or a few that have taken part for all 20 years of the program. And over 45 million lines of code have been produced during GSOC. So if you're not familiar with GSOC or Google Summer of Code, it's an online international program designed to encourage new contributors to participate in open source communities under the guidance of mentors from those open source communities. And they earn a stipend. That's kind of the, the baseline of what Google Summer of Code is. Now, the eligibility has changed a little bit, so just so you're familiar, it is open to those who are 18 years and older and who are either a student, so that's a student in any kind of academic program, or they are a beginner to open source software development. So that's a change, that beginner to open source software development is a change that we've made in the last three years because we wanted to expand the program because a lot of people were recent graduates, maybe they're changing careers, they're coming back into the workforce and they're like, oh, I'm not a student, I'm not eligible. We wanted to be able to open the program up to more of those people. So we have been getting about, I think this year's 11 and half percent of folks are not students. But again, when you've been doing this one way for 17 years, it takes a while for people to realize, oh wait, I'm actually eligible because they're like, oh, that's just for students. It's not. So if you can help us spread the word about that, we'd appreciate it. Um, a quick timeline on the program. We do GSOC once a year. The other programs I'm gonna talk about in a bit actually have multiple cohorts each year. But Google Summer Code, because it is so large, we just do one program each year. So this timeline, give or take, maybe a week will vary, but it's pretty much this sa the same every year. So organizations actually apply in the middle of January, mentoring organizations that want to take part in the program. We announce the accepted mentoring organizations in the middle of February. Usually that's going to be between 195 to 200 mentoring orgs that will be accepted each year. Then that point, and if you get nothing else from my talk today about Google Summer of Code, please remember, if you want to be a part of Google Summer Code and you want to apply for the program, you need to reach out right after the, if not before, but definitely right after those organizations are announced. And when I mean re by reach out, that means talk to the open source organizations. You need to reach out to them, tell them, you know, hey, I'm, I'm Jody, I wanna learn more about this, this project, I'm looking at your project ideas, this sounds really cool. You have to communicate because they're gonna to get tons of applications. If you wait until middle to late March when the actual application period begins, it's too late. Because at that point, they have thousands, well, each organization has dozens to hundreds of people coming in and asking them questions. They can't give you the time that you need. So if you reach out middle of February to end of February, you are significantly increasing your chances of being accepted into the program talk to the organizations. Because also, you have more time to talk to them, they have more time to talk to you, they're going to remember you, versus if you're one of the people, say, Mar or March 25th, who they're chatting with, they're not gonna remember you because they have 30 other people that they're responding to that day. So talk to them early. And the other thing is, the earlier you talk to an organization, the earlier you realize 
this is a great fit or eh, maybe not. Let me keep looking. Because the worst thing is to go, oh, this is the organization I'm going to work with. Great. And you go and you do a proposal and then you realize when you start chatting with them, eh, yeah, maybe not so much. It's kind of a little too late at that point. So make sure you reach out early. So again, the application's open for contributors on our site, middle of March. It's a two week period, 15 days actually. So middle to late March is usually when that, that application period is. And then the very first part of May is when we will announce the accepted contributors to the program. For example, this year for 2024, we had 1,220 accepted contributors. And then four weeks later, you will start the actual coding during the coding period. So quickly, some goals of GSOC, and really these goals pretty much go, are pretty appropriate for the other programs I'm gonna talk about today as well. But introducing new contributors to open source software development, and really helping these open source organizations bring in new excited developers who ultimately will stay involved in these open source communities after their program ends. That is really one of the ultimate goals. You want these folks to become excited about open source so they stay involved in these communities. Maybe they go on, create their own open source projects. Maybe they go on, become mentors themselves. All of those are kind of the ultimate goal for these programs. You also want to give, we're also giving contributors exposure to that real world software development. So they're going to learn testing, version control, software licensing, working with people from across the world, all these things that they're probably not taught, particularly in an academic environment or definitely not getting that real world experience. You know, you can do a theoretical, but it's a lot different when you're working with some kind of a large code base than it is when you're working with something theoretical in the classroom. Creating more open source code for everybody to be able to use and really helping early career professionals build their skill sets. Because when you have experienced developers helping teach you the ins and outs of being a great open source developer, you're gonna be a great open source developer. Well, if you're paying attention, at least. All right, so I kind of hit on this a little bit, but again, open source projects apply to be mentoring orgs. That happens mid-February. Google chooses the organizations. We announce them, I mean, sorry. Open source software projects apply to be mentoring orgs mid-January. We announce those orgs mid-February. Contributors submit their project proposals to the mentor orgs based on project ideas. So each organization has a list of project ideas that they want the contributors to work on. You choose what's interesting to you. No one's going to tell you, oh, you should do this project. You find what interests you. Because again, you're going to spend three plus months on this project. So make sure it's something that you care about. And then the mentor orgs go through all the applications they've received. They do that in April. And then at the beginning of May, we announce the accepted contributors. You're paired with at least one, often two or three mentors that are going to help you throughout the program. And also the community is really there to help guide you too. So if you're asking questions in their chat channels, anyone from the community could answer your questions. So you really are becoming part of the entire community. It's just not, it's not just you and your mentor. It's a relationship with the whole community. And then coding begins at the end of May. And for GSOC, most projects are about 12 weeks. I'll get into that here in just a second. Again. Choose a project that interests you. I can't say this enough. That and communication. Those are the two most important things. Search through, you can even do this right now. You can search through the GSOC org pages. You can look at some of the projects from 2024. About 84% of the projects have already wrapped up for this year. You can go in, look at this year's projects. And for those that say view code, that means their project is done. You can click on the view code button and they'll have a write up of the project that they did. You can see the code that they wrote. I will say some of these write-ups are better than others. Some are not good. But anyway, so look through, but it is interesting. It'll give you a good idea of what to expect. Reach out early, communicate early, communicate often. So again, if you wanna apply for GSOC, be sure you reach out to the organizations, definitely starting right after we announce the, the accepted organizations, which again happens middle of February. One of the things you really want to think about, we've added this over the last few years, 
We now have a concept of different size projects. So we have a small project, which is 90 hours, a medium, which is about 175 hours, and a large project, which is a standard 350 hours. So think about what your time commitments are. If you're finishing classes, you probably don't want to do a 350-hour project. That's a lot. Or maybe you have a part-time job. Trying to do a 350-hour project is going to be a lot. Don't do it. Or maybe you're taking care of loved ones or, or whatever the case may be. So think about what works for you. Now, we also, I mentioned that most projects are 12 weeks. We have actually started this concept of having an extended project. So maybe you know for the month of July you're going to be doing exams or you're going to move to another country or whatever it is. So you're not going to be available for a month. You can work with your mentor to extend your project to 14, 16, 18, 20, or even 22 weeks. So this is some flexibility we've added into the program. The other way it works is a lot of people start out with the 12-week program, and as they get to about 10 weeks, they go, eh, I'm not going to quite finish this project. And the mentor goes, yeah, you're not. So let's give it another two or four weeks. That happens a lot. That happened a lot this year. And finally, you do earn a stipend, and we do, we issue the stipends at the midpoint of the program. You have to pass an evaluation from your mentor, which as long as you were, you know, listening to your mentor, you're keeping up, meeting your milestones, you will pass. It's only when you disappear, ignore your mentor, things like that, that you don't pass. So when I say it's an evaluation, you don't need to stress about it. As long as you're doing the work, you'll be fine. And then at the end of the program, you get the final 50, you get 45% at the midterm, 55% at the end of the program. Here is our program site. Tons of information on that g.co slash gsoc. At the bottom, there is a help page. If you click on the help page, a whole bunch of stuff opens up, including the gsoc contributor guide. We also have a gsoc mentor guide. These are great guides, regardless of whether you are taking part in gsoc or not. About 95% of the information is relative to any open source community. So if you want to be a mentor in some other program, this is still a really helpful guide if you look at the mentor guide. And if you want to participate in an open source community, check out the contributor guide. There's a lot of stuff in there. It's kind of like, am I good enough? How do I get started? There are a lot of great things in the guide. And most chapters are about a page long, so it's not like you're going to have to read this massive book. So it's well worth it. So please check that out. And if you need to reach me, my contact is at the bottom there. All right. Now let's talk about Outreachy. All right, so I actually learned a lot when I was researching this because I thought I knew a lot about Outreachy, but I found out many new things. So I'm going to spread the word to you today. First of all, Outreachy are internships for people who face systemic bias or discrimination in the technology industry of their country. So that the Outreachy has expanded over the years and kind of this is the new guideline. But that also, they encourage people who are women, both cis and trans, trans men, uh, uh, non-binary non and gender fluid, gender queer, sorry, there's, there's a list. I knew I was going to forget, sorry. So any of these categories, please look into Outreachy. And you do not have to be a student. You do have to be 18 years or older, so that is important. And actually, interestingly, this is something I didn't know, that if you are a student, there are actually certain restrictions on which cohorts you can apply to. So I'm not going to go into all the requirements in here. They have really good documentation. It was great. So I highly encourage you to look at the eligibility and look at the documentation for Outreachy to get some more specifics on that. Another great thing about Outreachy is they have two cohorts a year. So Google Summer of Code, we have one. Outreachy has two. So they actually have the applications that open mid to late February, and then another cycle mid to late August. The internships themselves run from late May to late August and early December to early March, generally. They can vary a little bit, but that's pretty general. Also, you do earn a stipend, and the same amount, the stipend is issued the same amount for every project. By every project, I mean, it's not just coding projects. So this is a really cool thing with Outreachy, is that they actually have projects that are programming. They have projects that are data science, 
graphical design, illustration, documentation, and user experience. So they really are trying to show people there's so many different parts of being in an, involved in an open source community. So most of these, you do want to have a little bit of programming language or programming um, capabilities, but the pro projects themselves are, again, user experience, et cetera. So please check that out. All right, this was, this was interesting. So there's a three-step process for the outreach program. The initial application period will be filling out an application and answering some different questions. And you will make, you have to fill those out. Then one thing to keep in mind is that when you are filling out this application, there are a list of projects that some of the organizations that are taking part, some of the mentoring organizations, have listed. But there are still many other projects they have not listed yet. So even if you don't see something right away that interests you, go ahead and apply because over the next few weeks or couple of months, new projects will pop up. And so likely someone, something that's interesting to you will pop up in that time frame. So once all these applications come in, the outreachy folks go through, they review all of the essays and applications, they narrow it down to narrow it down to still a pretty large number, but narrow it down. And then those applicants will contact the mentors for these organizations and they'll also be making contributions to the communities. And this is actually a good point. With Summer of Code, you're also, most of the time, you're gonna be making some kind of a contribution, whether that is doing a pull request or something like that, because the organizations need to know kind of what your skill set is. And it's not just you say, hey, I can do this, and what you wrote on your resume, they can actually see, oh, okay, they can at least do these basic skills. Okay, great. So that is kind of why they ask for contributions both in GSOC and here in Outreachy. And then the applicants complete a final application, and then they go to the next stage where the mentors review all of their applications. They tell outreachy staff which interns that they're going to select. Then the applicants verify their time commitment details, the interns are announced, and then they start their projects a couple of weeks later. So one thing to keep in mind with all these programs is that the application processes do vary across each program and the timing of those processes vary. So be aware of that. Here is the program site. Again, very well documented. I was very impressed. So check that out. Oh, pictures, all right. Cool. All right. And then I'm gonna talk to you today also about the Linux Foundation Mentorship Program. This has been going on for about five years. And it's, it's very similar to Summer Code in that it is just for coding projects. And the other cool thing that they have is they actually have three different terms, is what they call them. So cohorts, terms, whatever. But they call them terms. They have one in their spring, so March 1st to May 31st. Another in June 1st to August 31st. And then a third one, September 1st to November 30th. Now, the interesting thing with uh, the LFMP, I'm going to abbreviate, is that their application process from beginning to end is much quicker than GSOC or Outreachy. So they actually have applications open about six weeks before the start of the term. And I guess those applications are open for about four weeks and then they review them and then they start the term a couple weeks later. So it's a very fast turnaround versus with Outreachy and GSOC, they are a bit longer. With LFMP, they also have two different options for the project timing. You can do a full-time project, which is about 12 weeks, or you can do a part-time project, which is 24 weeks. And just like Summer of Code, they have stipends that are issued at the halfway and at the final point of the program. And there is their site. Okay. All right. So I've talked about three different open source mentorship programs. They're all very similar with some few variations. LFMP and Outreachy have multiple cohorts a year. GSOC has just one. GSOC and LFMP focus only on coding projects. Outreachy is much broader and has many different kinds of projects available. GSOC has about 200 mentoring organizations each year and around 1,200 participants. LFMP and Outreachy have quite a few fewer. 
few of yours, have fewer contributors and open source projects and communities participating each year. But again, they do have multiple cohorts. And definitely the application processes vary significantly. So please look into each one and do your research because they are quite different. But by the end of all three programs, you'll definitely have improved and expanded your skills as a developer. You're going to be a part of this open source community. You are now a community member. You may go on to become a maintainer with this project. Many of the folks that have been part of GSOC I know have, and I'm sure the same with Outreachy as well. So you really have become embedded in this open source community. You also have ownership of your project. This is really important. This is something that in the feedback that we receive from GSOC students every year, they really talk about how proud they are of the work they've done. And you're gonna make it much easier to be able to point to this work, your work product, essentially, because now when you're going to apply for a job, you can show the recruiter or your employers, hey, this is a project that I did from beginning to end. That's a huge win on a resume. And that's a great, again, great experience because you've also now worked with real code bases. And in many cases, very large code bases. So keep that in mind. Your code is gonna be used by thousands, and in some cases, millions of people, which is pretty cool. Especially if you're, you know, well, at any age, really, that's pretty cool. But if you're 22 or 23, that's really pretty impressive. You're also now gonna understand best practices. Your mentor, one of their main goals is really to show you the open source way. And they're gonna show you from beginning to end how to be a part of the community, understand the norms, understand testing, understand reviews. They're really going to help you be a great open source contributor. And this is invaluable experience. That's one of the things that people tell us all the time about GSOC is like, I couldn't, I couldn't have gotten this experience any other way. Because what's cool about all these programs is they're online and you can do them from anywhere. So it doesn't matter what your university was or if you went to a university or not. This is if you're interested in open source and you meet the eligibility requirements of these particular programs, you can become a solid, great, we'll even say great, open source contributor. And you can learn so much during these programs. And you get to earn a stipend along the way. So you're, you're learning new skills and you're earning some money along the way. And often, most, or not most, many, many of the participants in these programs go on to become mentors themselves. So that's why I put this little bit at the end. No one's making you be a mentor, but it is something that is pretty special because so many people tell us that they, the programs change their lives. And so they want to be able to give back to others and help them have kind of that life-changing experience. All right. So to in conclusion, when deciding on a mentorship program, you want to think about how, how do you want to contribute? So if you're wanting to contribute code, then all three of these would work. Now, again, you got to make sure you're meeting the different eligibility requirements. And again, Outreach has, has more strict requirements than the other two. But do make sure that you are thinking about what type of project you want to work on. And definitely think about your time commitment. Think about what is going on in your life. If you're going to get married next summer and you're going to be planning a wedding, then maybe you want to do a small or medium project. You don't want to tackle a large project. you got a lot going on. So think about that. Also think about the skills that you have and those that you want to develop. Think about the open source community that interests you. This is where it does require you to do some research. With something like Google Summer Code, there's around 200 organizations each year. So we have different filters on our site so you can help narrow it down. So you can sort by security, AI, operating systems. You can also sort by languages. So if you know Rust or Python or whatever, you can go in and sort and filter that way. So it goes from 200 to maybe 20 or 30. So it's a little more manageable. So use those filters and things like that to help you find the community that works for you. And finally, the timing. Again, these different programs, GSOC is 
pretty much always the same timing each year. With Outreachy, there's two different cohorts. And with LFMP, they have three different terms each year. So think about what works with your life and your schedule. All right. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> questions? Yes, OK. I'm just going <laughs> to. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, do all the programs have limitations on how often you can participate in them? Maybe I missed that, but I know the LFX one, for example, that's a common misunderstanding. Yeah, very good question. Ah, there we go. Very good question. Uh, yes, I believe that is true. Um, with I know with Google Summer of Code, you can only be accepted as a student two times. You can pl apply however many times that you're eligible. So if you're a student, you know, if you're a PhD student, you might be a student for a very long time, but you can only be accepted into Google Summer Code twice. And I believe Outreachy has, I think you can only be accepted once, is that right? Yeah, you can only participate in Outreachy once. So, but good question. Any other questions? Ah, there we go, oh, there, there we go. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, hi. Hi. Um, I, I've noticed that you mentioned uh, this is mostly for uh, um, women, uh, LGBTQ uh, plus uh, members, and I was uh, wondering, because I didn't see it mentioned, uh, what about the people with the other type of disadvantages or disabilities? So you're, you're talking about outreach specifically. Yes. <laughs> Karen is... Karen, who started, is co-founded Outreachy is sitting over here in the third row. And so she's nodding her head, yes. And anyone who is subject to discrimination. Yeah, anyone subject to discrimination. We don't even know what the discrimination everybody experiences. Right. Yeah, so, so in your essay is one of the question is, what is that discrimination that you experienced? And so you, you state it in their, in their different essay questions. So, yeah, great question. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So, quick question. How important are the companies behind an open source community when you are choosing that? And is that a factor that might influence a decision to participate in? Sure. So, I, th so I think the question is, how important are the, like, the mentoring organizations? Like, for example, for GSOC. Is exactly. That and okay. if they have behind them, like, uh, founders, members, or supporters, like other commercial entities, how important is that in the selection process? For, I can only speak for GSOC on this one, okay. because that one's the one I am familiar with, because I make those decisions. Um, but yes, we, when we're looking at the applications from the mentoring organizations, we're looking at things like, is there a community? You know, if it's three people, yeah, no. How old is the community? Is it only been around for eight months? Yeah, give it a couple of years. You know, things like that. We're also, so we're looking at your, you know, we go in and look at your code and we just see like one or two people that have been active for the last year. Yeah, it's kind of a dead project, you know, so that's, those are all no's. The other major thing, and I will, it's again, huge, if you're applying to be a mentoring org for GSOC, your ideas list is key. That is what we base the majority of our decision on. We look at every single ideas list. We, in our mentor guide, we have very specific guidelines that we want you to provide, and the, do not... Do not, do not, do not, and Mary knows exactly what I'm going to say here, do not link to um, your GitHub. Do not link to just a repo. That is so annoying. Um, it will be an automatic no. So make sure that you are following the instructions, because one of the things we say is you need to have a project idea. It needs to show the difficulty level. Uh, Let's see, I think of all the different things on there. Um, the category, any potential mentors, which maybe you don't know the mentors yet, and that's okay. That's, that's not a game changer. But you need to have a description. So people who just link to their GitHub and they're just showing, oh, these are um, some, it's like their issue tracker. Like, oh, these are five things. And it's like one sentence. It's like, no, you didn't put in the effort or time to come up with a project ideas list. Because that project ideas list is the same thing that contributors are going to look at. So if that's what they're seeing, it's just like, eh, you didn't put any effort. So that is an automatic no. 
Um, that makes it my life a lot easier. I'm like, nope, next one. So don't do that. Some people, this is where it gets interesting. Some people do, <laughs> do link uh, to an issue tracker, but within the issue tracker, they have all kinds of, ooh, have all kinds of other pages that actually do the things that we tell, you know, that say, okay, here's the project idea. Here's the project size. Here's the difficulty level, blah, blah, blah. Oh, project size. That's the other thing. So if it's a small, medium, or large project. Oh, follow up. Okay. Yeah, so, so that begs for a follow up. You mentioned you accept uh, up to 200 organization. Out of how many applicants, if you can disclose? Yeah, it changes. Sorry, is that so loud? Sorry, y'all. Um, it changes each year, depending, you know, but last year or this year, we had, I think, just under 400, and we accepted, I think we had like 391, something like that, and we accepted 195 this year. So, any other questions? I think we're right about time. I can probably take one more if anybody has any questions. Oh, there we go. I was about to ask much the same thing. You, you know, how, uh, how do organizations and projects apply? Entrance, e &F calls on level zero for the Tux track. Oh, well. <laughs> Join us for drinks. Or uh, maybe we discuss it over a drink, huh? <laughs> Okay. Sponsor products and technologies. Sorry, so what was the question? Okay, okay, okay sorry. <laughs>